Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of the Brutal Truth About Sales and Selling podcast. We're going to be talking about a career in sales today. What's it like to sell your whole lifetime? <laughs> and what do you learn through that process? And how do you share that with other people? I think you're really going to enjoy this interview. And I just wanted to thank everybody for tuning in and helping the podcast out by sharing the content on LinkedIn or just telling a friend about it. I really appreciate it. Uh, prices are going up on the courses. Oh, wait. Oh, the end of January, and it's just around the corner. So make sure you get in. Uh, if you'd like to talk about them, uh, you can go to b2brevenue.com. Uh, there's two main courses. One is top of funnel, uh, start the conversation, get the meeting. So it goes from prospecting to get starting that initial conversation to qualification and determining level of interest, level of applicability, and to do it all by cold outreach that isn't cold. It's counterintuitive, but it really works. Uh, people are scaling it up really well. The other course is Closing the Complex Sale, which takes the deal from that initial conversation all the way to closure. So whatever struggle you're up against, are you not getting enough meetings? Uh, or are you getting meetings, but the deals just don't seem to go as fast and as big and as predictably as you'd like? Well, then start then closing the complex sales, your course. So check them out at b2brevenue.com. Also, make sure you're checking out CoVideo. CoVideo is the way to do video emails today. It's the way to connect and engage with your target audience. It is insanely effective and organic and natural way of communicating value, showing your product even, uh, giving a little personalization and break through that noise so that you can really communicate with your target audience. So check it out at covideo.com and also PipeDrive. PipeDrive's got a 30-day eval for you with the Brutal Truth coupon. It's what I use for a CRM. It connects up with your calendar in your email system, and it's super easy to use, so it makes using a CRM uh, not a pain in the butt. So pipedrive.com, enter the coupon code BRUTALTRUTH, and I'm throwing in the questions that sell course for anybody who joins, uh, either start the conversation, get the meeting, or closing the complex sale if you order in January before the prices go up. Let's get it in the interview, and I'll sum it up at the end. Hey, Kurt, thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, tell us about yourself. Thanks, Brian. Good to be here. Well, my name is Kurt Mortensen. I'm passionate about influence, persuasion, charisma, mostly because... They didn't teach me in school, as you know. No. <laughs> Spent all this money on a college degree and a graduate degree in business. You get thrust in the workforce and you realize, wow, I am not ready. <laughs> I'm dealing with emotional people. I, I need to influence, persuade. And that's when I started taking a deep dive in the world of persuasion, motivation, and influence to try to figure out you know, why people do what they do. I was able to interview people after, after they've lied to other salespeople because most of the time, as you know, they lie. And try to take a, a different feel of the world of influence and what's different and what's changed. And we realize that a lot of the old style skills don't work. I mean, we, we always talk about closing skills and there's a time and place for those. But I think closing skills in a lot of ways is like trying to get a kiss after a bad date. <laughs> if, <laughs> yeah. if, you know, if people don't like you and trust you, there, a clever phrase, again, there's a time and place, but a clever phrase isn't going to help you out. So that was an eye opener. And then. The reality that up to 95% of influence involves a subconscious trigger or a feeling. I like them, I don't like them, I trust them, I don't trust them. And that's been fascinating to me to understand the, the subconscious emotional side of influence and persuasion. And then when I realized that most CEOs have a sales and marketing background, that's what I knew. This is the ticket. This is the key to everyone's success because everyone persuades for a living, whether you're a parent, teacher, leader, manager. It's a critical life skill, and I was mad they didn't teach me, so I've made it my goal to not only learn it and understand it, but to help people really realize this is the critical skill. Excellent. And tell us about your sales career. Kind of give us some context on that. Well, sure. I've done everything from you know sales from door to door. That's always fun to on the phone to B2B to B2C. Then went into the sales manager role and then to the sales training role, which has been very fulfilling to help people understand there's a direct correlation between your ability to persuade, influence, and sell in your income, regardless of your career, and helping people understand. And it's hard for, and I'm sure you realize this too, is that it's everyone sales for a living. It doesn't matter what position you are, if you're on commission, everyone sales for a living. 
Uh, yeah, and we certainly do. And you brought up a lot of great points. Um, who's your, kind of your ideal uh, account right now? Who typically pulls you in? For training? Yeah. For consulting? Oh, uh, usually a large uh, sales floors in the uh, working over the phone. Those that are working on their presentation skills that do uh, group meetings, those are the type of people that I resonate with. And a big topic, too, is the, the ability to influence without authority, how to persuade without position is a big topic now because as organizations get flatter and people realize that the, the power and position doesn't have the same pulls it used to is also an ideal person that we like to train. So let's dig into that. How how do we persuade, persuade today versus what used to work? Well, I mean, the big changes are, well, first of all, trust is an all-time low. Yeah. I think we all realize that. And we have to help salespeople understand that even though you're good, trustworthy people, it doesn't mean that people trust you. You know, 20 years ago, it was probably, I trust you, give me reason not to. Now it's, wait a minute, I don't trust you. <laughs> give me reason you get, to. Yeah. Better give me reason to trust you, right? <laughs> and then... Uh, access to information. We got uh, Mr. Google out there and all those search engines, which can help or hurt the ability to destroy even training medical doctors. And they have a hard time with this because they go to school for what, eight, 12 years and they diagnose the patient. They say, here's your medication. Here's your regimen. Then they go to Dr. Google <laughs> and find somebody in Indiana that says, just eat a banana. You'll be fine. <laughs> and they believe banana boy over the doctor. And that's a big challenge. So access to information and and part of that, too, according to Advertising Age magazine, we're bombarded with over 5,000 persuasive messages a day. So we become numb. And then we talked about that power. People just don't respect power. I was training the Michigan State Police on influence skills. and like, well, you have guns. What do you need influence skills for? Because <laughs> when I see a cop, it's like, yes, sir. But now, as, as people get younger, they just don't respect that power, that authority, that title as much as they used to. And so do it or you're fired or do it because I'm the boss just doesn't have the same pull as it used to. And that is a huge change. And that, of course, the way we communicate in the world being uh, more working with more worldwide organizations just changes the game. Now, how, how do you recommend people develop and build trust with somebody that they don't know? Well, there's a lot of aspect of trust. We talk about character. And people understand that. Then there's the competence factor, your knowledge, your intelligence, your ability. A couple, just a couple quick tips that I've noticed. Let's take the most important one is your credibility. And a couple lessons in credibility that can help everyone build trust. If you look at all what I call the five C's of trust, credibility is the most important. There's two lessons here people need to take away from this is that number one, it's okay and you should and you must borrow credibility. It's okay. Because you have something to gain as a salesperson, and even though this is not fair, we don't deal with fair, we deal with reality, is that people will always believe somebody else before they believe you. That's just the bottom line. So an endorsement, a recommendation, a testimonial is power that you need to use when you're going to a situation of low trust. Other people that have worked with you, and someone to introduce you, someone to recommend you, you can borrow credibility. And the other one, which is counterintuitive, which a lot of people haven't thought about, is that people are so skeptical and distrusting now that when they see your product, your proposal, or even you or your company, your industry, they are looking for something that's wrong. And they will find something that's wrong. And so I recommend give them something that's wrong. Give them a minor weakness about your proposal, your product, your service, and turn it into a strength. Yeah. Because it's better for you to give them one, or the other, otherwise they're going to make one up. And if they make one up, that's not what you want. I mean, we see this in advertising all the time. Avis, we're number two. No weakness, but we try harder. Smuckers, you know, the jams with a name like that, it's, it's got to be good. The Heinz ketchup, it's too thick. It takes forever. They're like, that's quality. What do you want, a runny ketchup? Or my favorite, the Volkswagen Bug in the 60s when it came out. They said, this car is so slow, you'll never get a speeding ticket. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a critical thing. I mean, it's a small aspect of trust, but that's the most important thing. Just a few quick tips and tools to help people gain that trust. And, and a final thing there too, if you're meeting someone for the first time and they're talking to other salespeople and you're one of many, if you, you have two minutes to teach them something new, unique, different, a different insight, a different study, you've got two minutes to develop that credibility for them to really open up and listen to you and start to develop that trust.
And, you know, those are all, you know, kind of strategic things. How about tactical? How about like when you're either cold calling or prospecting or trying to get into an account? What, what's working for you today? What do you teach today? Well, that comes back to, you know, connectivity, people skills, building the trust. So that comes back to, you know, the two minutes, teaching them something new, learning to understand their personality. Part of it, too, is when you're meeting somebody for the first time or talking on the phone, decide, is this a person I need to build trust with or do I need to connect with them? And we need to decide right at the very beginning. And you can tell a lot from the way they greet you. Hey, how are you doing? How's everything going? We can connect. We can talk. But if they're writing to get to the point or what is your product, how can you help me? You need to build trust and credibility right away. I mean, there's a time and place for people skills and connectivity, but some people want to go right to trust. And that's a big complaint is I, I interview people that have talked to salespeople is some people say getting too friendly too fast. Some people complain about the vomit, <laughs> getting too much information too fast. But if you could really learn to adapt, because that's a big challenge for salespeople, and this helps with the, the trust factor, is that everyone's default setting is they tend to sell how they like to be sold. They tend to persuade how they like to be persuaded. And that is completely wrong. You need to learn to adapt to persuade them how they want to be persuaded and, and get more tools. The average salesperson uses four to five tools over and over again. There's over 100 sales tools. And as Mazzo says, if the only tool in your toolbox is a hammer, you treat everyone like a nail. Yeah. And what, what's your favorite tool? <laughs> the postal digger. <laughs> postal digger. <laughs> <laughs> I bring that up because a lot of people have postal diggers. I don't know if everyone knows what that is. I but have no you, idea what it is. <laughs> It's a tool that you use maybe once a year when you need to dig a hole straight down. But the 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 thought being that you only might use it once or twice a year, but when you need it, you have to have it. There's really no other option. Yeah. I mean, I could chop down a tree with a hammer. I could. But it would take too much time and too much effort. There's better tools like a chainsaw <laughs> or a stick of dynamite. <laughs> Those are the type of things that make a huge difference. Yeah. And when you go to get a, accounts, what, what's your process? What works for you today? Well, the biggest thing is you got to cut through the clutter. You've got, first of all, you've got to spark their interest. You've got to grab their attention. And that's one tip that I can give out. When It's different. When somebody calls you about your product or service for information, you've got to find out what they want and they need, You know what's in it for them. If you're calling them, you've got to create it and yeah. create it real fast. And people don't realize that they do the same pitch, the same – and learning to adapt. Even if you're leaving a voicemail, you can peg their personality. If they say, it's it's Bob, you know the drill, you know that's a different voicemail than there's music in the background. Sally says, your call is important to me. I'll get back to you in 24 <laughs> hours, right? I mean you've, you've left enough voicemails to know, but some people just over and over, same voicemail, same voicemail, being robotic. And, and that's a big complaint about voicemail. Sounds robotic, didn't repeat the number, went too fast. So where you have to remember, that's the very first time they've listened to your voice and you need to make sure you leave a message accordingly. So, you know, spark in their interest and then from there going down the, the connecting route or the trust route and then perform that, you know, that examination, asking the questions. It's no secret that great salespeople ask three times more questions or better listeners because and that's a secret. We can we can stop if And, you know, this is so basic, but nobody does it is that. If you ask the right questions and listen, they'll tell you everything you need to know to sell them, or you can vomit on them and hope something sticks. Very different outcomes. Yeah. And how far, how much success are you having on social versus the phone versus email versus in, in-person networking? I'd say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's that marketing mix. I mean, a lot of it's going to the social media, obviously. We're doing that. Word of mouth is a big one for me. I mean, that's probably the biggest one. Uh, someone who's read the book or word of mouth or they've seen me train or they recommend me to another department or in another company uh, at this point. And that should be something everyone works towards to where most of your business is coming from word of mouth recommendations, referrals. And, and that's something we always have to work with salespeople on is, uh, you know, start up front, expect the referrals, ask for the referrals. And when you've done a good job, you've solved their problem, you've exceeded expectations, they're more than happy to give you referrals. Okay. So referrals are your main resource? Or? That's probably the main. You know, the you know, internet websites, social media would probably be second. The 
the third, you know, the the email list, those type of things, and then from there we go into some some cold calling and of course uh, just face to face presentations. Yeah, and and how do you get a referral? What what's the process? I mean, because that's kind of a an overlooked art, isn't it? Oh yeah, and, and every salesperson knows that a referral is worth a hundred times more than a cold lead. Because the resistance is down, the, there's a little more trust because you're borrowing some credibility. So I start off with the expectation, say, look, you know, I work off referrals, and uh, when we're done and I've exceeded expectations, I've solved your problem, I'm going to ask you for some. So I ask him right up front that this is the expectation, this is what I'm going to do so it doesn't surprise him. And then when you do ask for referrals, say, ask him for, for two or three or four or five. So they'll give you one or two. It's kind of human nature. And ask them if they'll, you can drop their name or ask them even better for them to make a phone call and do an introduction. And, you know, it's a tight network with a lot of these business owners, especially in technology, do a lot with high tech and pharmaceuticals. They, they know each other in different companies and organizations. And you have to have the mindset they are more than happy to do this. When you've exceeded those expectations again and solved their challenge, the people they're talking to have the same challenges. They're more than happy to give that one, that give the referral. And that's part of your expectations. You know, you would be able to give me any referrals, would you? <laughs> of course they won't. When you ask the wrong way, you have the expectation, set it up front, and when you ask for it, ask for it in the right way. And that's it. I think people do it too early. They haven't earned it. Because I think it is a, it's something you earn. It's not something you request. I like that. Exactly. It is something they've earned it, right? Like I said, when you've exceeded their expectations, you've earned the right to ask for a referral, and they're more than happy to do it. But if you're asking, like you said, too soon, or your product really hasn't solved their needs, or you just went through the motions, or there's no, they're, you're not going to get the referral. So I think some people have asked too soon, then they just kind of put their head down. Well, that hurt. They said no, and they never do it again. You got to step up and start doing it the right way. Yeah. Because I think that is, you know, super powerful. And I think too many people kind of prospect from people they don't know at all <laughs> instead of <laughs> people they do know outward. Yeah, um, it's like that cold call. It's like, well, do you know anybody else that would be interested? Like, okay, <laughs> obviously they've rejected you. They're not going to give a referral. <laughs> well, that's it. And you, all of a sudden you're talking to somebody completely cold. And that without any context or referral or reference or anybody in common, it's nothing to really warm it up. And I, are you seeing those days diminishing to almost zero or? I mean, they're diminishing. I wouldn't say that there's zero, but things are diminishing. Things have changed as far as the world of sales is concerned, but we have to just adapt to those changes, embrace them and, and move on. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and where do you see sales going in the next couple of years? I mean, you've seen a lot of change. I've seen a lot of change. It's ha it's happening pretty fast, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you still have to have that personal touch where the over the phone or the face to face. I mean, that will always be there for a lot of different people. But of course, it's going more to the information age where we're using Skype or webinars or you know, email me more information. I think a big shift is going to be where we're doing more trainings via the computer, where we're sharing computer screens and showing them, we're becoming a lot more visual. And here's an important tip. YouTube is now the number two search engine. Well, think about that. We don't want to read it, okay? I don't want to read your brochure, your technical analysis, or why it's going to work. Show me. Yeah. Tell me. I want to see it. That is a huge shift to where we have to get better at our presentation skills, create more videos, be more engaging. Gone are the days, you know, I teach university classes on these topics. Gone are the days of just educating people. The new term is edutainment. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to be engaging. In fact, I asked students the first day, how many of you are here to see if I'm any good? And I'll get a third to half the class just to see. They don't want to sit through education. They want to be entertained. They want to be engaged. They want someone that's charismatic. And that's part of the process. You can't just educate anymore. You've got to engage them either with your presence at a, a group meeting or a video or something. Don't just send them an email anymore. At least send them an audio or something else. That's a big shift in, that we're going to see more and more, especially the next couple of years. That's it. I, I think this was kind of the year of video, both on LinkedIn, video emails become super mm -hmm. popular. 
Uh, and I think you're right. If you're not engaging them with some kind of entertainment in very quick value-based, whatever they term value is, and talk in their language instead of your acronym, latent industry speak that people no, no one understands, uh, yeah. you're just, you're just going to lose people. <laughs> you I, will. And I think, I'm oh, sorry. The, I just just shout out to the salespeople at Panic Club. I'm not a good presenter. Oh, A, get the skills, but B, with YouTube, people's expectations are a lot lower. <laughs> they, they are. Yeah. And you can do anything from, you know, a two minute video and then kind of build it up to a full webinar, but uh, you've got to get them. You got to get them and realize they don't expect perfection. YouTube has taught us that, that if you're out there, you're real, you're authentic, that you can do it. You can learn to do it. It's not a skill that you're born with. You could definitely learn how to do it. Yeah. Hey, if you were to start your career over again, what would you do differently? I. I can't say, I don't know if I would not go to college. I mean, college is good. <laughs> I mean, there's good things there, but I think about the real learning and life skills that I learned. I'd probably spend either find a different university that would teach the life skills, the leadership skills, the influence skills, the emotional intelligence. I would either probably learn that, that sooner. I think that would be a big one that I would learn and help teach people understand the importance of it to, and, and that the, the big eye opener for me, I mentioned earlier is that, I would have spent more time understanding human nature because we've learned more about the human brain in the last 10 years and the last 100 years combined. And the big eye opener was that most influence involves that subconscious trigger, that feeling. I like them. I don't like them. I trust them. I don't trust them. And it's been, uh, it's been fascinating to me. It could be the, the color of your clothes. It could be a smell. When people are dealing with the smell of Cinnabon, they're more likely to donate to a charity. How close you're standing, your gestures, your word choice, your tone of voice. Do you have facial hair? Are you wearing sunglasses? All these things are coming into play that go through our amygdala in our brain and taint everything that's said with emotion and with feeling. We could not not be emotional. And, and in realizing, if I would have learned this earlier, that we are not thinking creatures that feel. We are feeling creatures that think. And that little piece would have... Would uh, say would help me make a lot more money as a salesperson early on to really understand it's not about the logic, it's not about the data dump. I mean, it is. You need to have your your core competence and your product knowledge, but the other eighty five percent are these soft skills. They are. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. And I, I see too many people overlooking it, and I think we're blinded from it because we're focused on our own survival, our own feelings and needs, and wants and logic. And it's hard to understand that the other person is also doing that. And it becomes this conflict. And it's like, and it seems to take 10, 20 years for a salesperson to kind of get over that. <laughs> Do they ever get over that? If, if they, if they learn ever, it yeah, yeah, again and again. And I think part of it, too, is we, like you mentioned, we're concerned about ourselves or in our own world. But I think when we're so close to a product or a service, we kind of lose the emotional attachment. We lose the passion sometimes. And we just think logically and think our prospects thinking logically and that becomes a disconnect. Yeah. Uh, how about as far as what industry would you pick if you had to do it all over again? Mm. Did you pick the right ones? I don't know. Well, I don't know. I'm pretty diverse from pharmaceuticals yeah. to government to high tech. I love the, the thing. I, I mean, if I was going to focus on an industry early on, of course, it probably would have been the high tech industry. I mean, that's the software software as a service. I mean, those are really exploded now starting early on, and those are the exciting ones for me because the high-tech, the the cryptocurrency world, Bitcoin, blockchain, that's a great one that's starting getting ready to explode. The the ones, But then pharmaceutical, too, that's always going to be a big one that people need. So if I would have chose one or two, probably high-tech or pharmaceuticals, those are a lot of fun and always moving and changing, and nothing stays static. Any mistakes that you've made during your career that you'd like to share with us? Oh, no, I've never <laughs> no? made any mistakes. I didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I've made plenty of mistakes. I'm like the blunder king. <laughs> I had to learn early not to vomit. I had to learn early to, to shut up and know when to close because most people are – and I was very guilty of – you know, they're like, how do we get started? I'm like, you know, no, I'm done with my presentation yet. Hold on. <laughs> You're like, hello, I should have shut up. But my biggest mistakes come from, you know, as a professional presenter, doing keynote addresses and doing trainings. And, you know, I teach a lot of people how to do persuasive presentations and overcoming the fear of public speaking. I let them know, I was like, look, I've made bigger mistakes than you'll ever make. <laughs> I've fallen off a two foot stage. I couldn't see the end. The lights were in my face. I've fallen off a stage. I've tripped on the way to a lectern. 
I've uh, got into this meeting. I was running late, went to the front, and they're like, it was at a hotel. I'm like, what, what are you? I'm like, you're ne- I'm your next trainer. And they're like, no, you're not. And I was in the wrong room. <laughs> so I've done that. <laughs> or worse, the guy in the front row that's motioning with his fingers up, and my fly was down, way down. <laughs> Or seven hours into an eight-hour presentation, took a drink of water, went down the wrong pipe, and sprayed the whole front row. Yeah. Done it. Probably the worst one, though, is when they put the lavalier on the wireless mic and say you have 10 minutes, and you think you have enough time to go to the restroom, not realizing the, the mic is live. <laughs> and they hear the <laughs> and then you come into the room, and like, we know what you did. <laughs> so, I mean, having a sense of humor, know you're going to make mistakes. I think I know people like you more. Yeah, I can go for hours on mistakes and blunders. But that's how we learn. That's how we grow. It's human. When we try to say, well, when I'm perfect, when I know everything, we get paralyzed and do nothing. So a lot of a lot of different salespeople, the ready, fire, aim model can be beneficial because otherwise you'll never get out and learn anything. I hope you enjoyed that. I've heard a lot of um, <laughs> sales experts say it's all about competence. Well, that, that's nice. Well, what does competence mean? Uh, it might mean knowing about your business, their business, the economy, the market, uh, the technology. It means a lot. So it takes a lot to become what some would think is competent. But do we have time for that? What we have to do is be as competent as we can, given the amount of time that we have. Uh, and we're all trying. We've got so many things to use our time on, and it's all about focus. I think sales is just one of those professions that focus and attention and judgment are critical of what to spend your time on, what to care about, in what order. And that is an individual choice that we all have to make every day, and we make it, whether we uh, volunteer to make it or not. So think about that. Think about what is most important to you and how do you get it. Uh, so I hope you check everything out at b2brevenue.com. Make sure you check out pipedrive.com. I'm working together with them on some content that's coming up that will be part of the show on objection handling, pretty much every part of the sales cycle. And they're also looking for experts in particular verticals, real estate, finance, recruitment, uh, SaaS. So if you'd like to be part of that, uh, contact them or contact me, and I'll put you in touch with the right people. Also, make sure you're checking out my partners over at CoVideo and uh, PipeDrive. Check them out. you got to get on to the video emails. It's going to be a game changer for you this year, I hope. It's going to be a great year. Let's, let's do it together. We'll see you next time. At work to get uh, expand and meet new people, people that could help him with his business, people that help get the word out, and these little efforts, these little things tend to mount up and we tend to only focus on what is going to close right now. And we should, but we, and when we have other time, we should be focused on what can close sooner or later. And sales is a priority thing. And it may sound, sound contradictory because I'm always talking about, you know, prioritize in the order of closure. And I, I agree with that a hundred percent, but then we have the rest of the day And the rest of the day, we tend to just go out and try and find totally cold things as opposed to things that we had touched three months ago, six months ago, because timing in sales is so critical. Uh, The people who are in market and active, they come to us. The people that is the real market are people that shouldn't talk to us, but the timing just isn't right. They don't know what we do yet. They're not even curious. Their level of interest hasn't peaked yet. That's our job. And we can't do it directly. If we do it directly, that's a take. That's not a give. And a give, we have to become creative at because we're not used to that. So I I listened to this episode a couple of times because it it really is gold. Uh, If you really want to get good at this, start the conversation, get the meeting is for you. It takes your whole addressable market, prioritizes it, and I show you a systematic way of doing this that isn't time-consuming, isn't cold calling, isn't cold emailing. It's organic, it's natural, and it really is a process to what Gary is talking about uh, that it takes the thinking out of it because it's a lot of work if you do it um, 
you know, one off every time. But if you have a systematic way of doing it, it's really powerful. If your challenge is you're getting in and talking to people, but the deals are stalling, there's no decision, it's stuck. Uh, you're not really sure where it is or where it has to go, and you just need help. Closing the complex sale is for you, and it's just great for anybody who wants to take their game to the next level. And if if you're the B player that thinks, oh, I know everything, I've done everything, it's the market, that's the problem, it's my territory. Well, that's not the course for you. I don't know what, I think therapy is the course for you. But if you really want to take your game to the next level, including me, and that's why I came up with the year of excellence. What I wanted to do was, let, let me document the very best I've seen. Let, let me do the research, curate it, condense it into something that, reps can take and not have to, oh, read four books on this, five books on that. The problem with that is, yeah, you get a lot of knowledge, but you don't take any action and you forget it and you move forward and you get stuck in the rut. How do you come up with a systematic way within a year, whether you start in January or you start in November, it doesn't matter. You just get into it and get momentum and get what I call compound selling. See, my frustration as a sales rep was I didn't see enough compounding. And I always was obsessed with compound interest ever since I was a kid. And if you want to learn about it, check out uh, Warren Buffett's documentary on HBO. It is pure gold because he was obsessed with it. And the idea is that you don't start like Groundhog Day every day. You build off of every day. You build off of your skills. You become better. You get compound interest. And over time, you get the hockey stick. Now, if you don't do this, you tend to just level off and actually sink because you get burnt out. And I've seen too many of my friends later in their career, they get burnt out and all that skill kind of goes away because their attitude and their motivation isn't there. They didn't compound. So that's kind of the, the theme of a year of excellence. It's going to be included if you sign up for closing the complex sale in January. Uh, you can buy it all at once or there's a payment plan. It's not a subscription. It's not a membership. It's a year-long access uh, to all the content from day one. So you'll get all the office hours that I did in 2018, so 25 hours of that. And you can get one-on-one, -on -one, so you get a sales coach that's here for you. And if there's something that would make the course enticing for you, let me know. You can schedule a call with me at b2brevenue.com. And make sure you're checking out CoVideo. They've done some incredible work. And this year, if you're not using video email, it is a big mistake. You've got to find a way of connecting up with your audience, being organic and natural and authentic. And that's the way to do it. It's different. It's new. it's not really new, but it's new to you. It's going to be new to a lot of your customers, and it's going to be the way to really engage with your marketplace. And you're just going to miss out if you're not doing it. So check that out at covideo.com. Appreciate everybody listening. We'll see you next time.